everyone. I want to welcome you to uh, uh, Climate Change Challenges Solutions. Um, our new uh, uh, topic for today will be on agriculture and food production in light of climate change. Uh, but before we go there, before we do that, I would like to introduce uh, Tyler Hall, who is a first year mechanical engineering student, is also uh, heavily involved in uh, the Husky Environmental Action Team. Um, and uh, we give him a few minutes. Uh, he'll share with you uh, one way of thinking about solutions, especially in the context of this institution. And then I will come back here, introduce our guest speakers and the topic, and um, we'll take it from there with yet one more slight change to the usual program. But uh, first, Tyler, it's all yours. so many outstanding speakers have to say. I'm really glad that I can be up here to hopefully add to your experience and tell you about one of the largest environmental campaigns of our time, the fossil fuel divestment movement. Maybe some of you have heard of this in the news, or maybe for some of you, this is the first time you've heard of it. Either way, I hope I can share some insight into what this campaign is all about and why it's so important. Across the country, over 250 colleges and universities have divestment campaigns underway. This is quite possibly the largest student mobilization for an environmental cause ever. Already, four schools have agreed to divest. Hampshire College, Unity College, Sterling College, and College of the Atlantic. And this movement isn't limited to schools either. The city of Seattle has begun to divest its funds from the fossil fuel industry as well. So, what is divestment anyway? To put it simply, it's the opposite of the investment means getting rid of stocks, bonds, or other investment funds that are unethical or morally ambiguous. Divestment is not a new tactic by any measure. It's had a handful of successes in recent history, the most impactful of which involves South African apartheid. In the 1980s, students at 155 college campuses convinced their administrations to divest from companies doing business in South Africa. I'm sure some of you are proud to know that Northeastern did indeed demonstrate its leadership in this campaign. So divestment was instrumental in solving the injustices in South Africa, but why has it become such an important part of the climate change discussion? After all, we depend on fossil fuels every day to provide us with the services we need, like light, comfort, and mobility. So if we are the ones buying the product, then is the fossil fuel industry really at fault here? This is a graph of the energy sources in the US over the past 60 years. As you can see, our use of renewables pales in comparison to our consumption of coal, petroleum, and natural gas. Sure, there's been some modest progress. You might be able to make up a slight uptick in wind energy over the past decade. But given the magnitude of the problem we face, I don't think it's unreasonable to wish we'd done better. And the fact is, we can do better. Hopefully I can convince you that fossil fuel divestment is the most logical thing. <coughs> you see, these industries are doing much more than just providing us with fuel. They're doing everything in their power to make sure we stay dependent on the fuel. I came across a recent report by the American Petroleum Institute in which the industry's top PR reps did their best to paint a benign picture of the oil and gas industry. The report is filled with graphs like this one of net income per dollar sales that show the fossil fuel industry falling right in line with all the other industries. I'd like to show you something that the people writing that report might not want you to see. Here are the combined net incomes of the top 20 companies in each sector. As you can see, the energy sector, which needless to say is dominated by coal, oil, and natural gas companies, tops the list at $250 billion. One of my favorite quotes from the report, that the energy industry is a capital-intensive industry requiring huge investments. But you know, I don't think it really comes as any surprise that radically altering the chemical composition of the atmosphere is a capital-intensive industry. But let me get something straight. Being big doesn't automatically make a company bad. Making money is not a sin, and profit is not evil. It's what these companies do with their money and how they make it. That is the problem. So before I go on, let me motivate the discussion a little further. Carbon dioxide, as you all know, is a greenhouse gas. 
that's been in our atmosphere for thousands and thousands of years, and for most of that time has remained at a reasonable level that's allowed life and human civilization to flourish. This blue box represents all of the CO2 in our atmosphere prior to the Industrial Revolution. This pink box is all of the CO2 that humans have added to the atmosphere to date. And while it may seem small in comparison to the blue box, just this increase has led to record heat and ever more powerful storms. Now this next box is the additional amount of CO2 that we can add to the atmosphere and cause a further two degrees Celsius increase in global average temperature. This is the maximum safe level of warming agreed upon by almost every country even the oil-rich ones like the United Arab Emirates. And while this isn't truly a safe level, if we do exceed it, we risk drastically accelerating the pace of climate change. Up to four billion people could experience water shortages. Millions would go hungry. The malaria virus would spread into new territory, putting 40 to 60 million people at risk. And the melting of the Greenland ice sheet may become irreversible. That said, let me show you something scary. 2,795 gigatons. In short, it's the amount of carbon that we are currently planning to burn. Now the key point here is not just that that number is higher than the 565 gigatons that everyone says is the maximum safe level. It's five times higher. The fossil fuel industry, despite this, will do everything in its power to make sure that that carbon is burned. Because their value, their stock price, and their future depends on those reserves. Worse, they're actively searching for even more. Last year, Shell, Chevron, and Exxon combined spent $6 billion on exploration. And they spend fortunes telling the public that everything is going to be just fine. In the five years starting in 2006, a study by the Checks and Balances Project followed the $16.5 million that fossil fuel interests gave out to 10 organizations. They found that combined, those 10 organizations were cited a total of 1,010 times on energy issues in 60 major media outlets. The nature of those comments range from attacking clean technology and clean energy policy and promoting fossil fuels. Comments like, the projections of trillion dollars of damage from global warming is largely fantasy, and that wind and solar technology is unproven and not economically viable. These interests dominate our media, but also our government. In recent years, they've ramped up their lobbying to new heights and are now at a level untouchable by environmental groups. And for all their hard work, this industry is coddled by policymakers. They receive far more in tax breaks and direct spending than any other energy initiative. But the influence of this industry doesn't even stop there. A few weeks ago, myself and 40,000 others gathered down in Washington, D.C. to urge President Obama to reject the Keystone XL pipeline. It was the largest gathering for climate action in history. <coughs> now, we knew President Obama was away that weekend, and I don't blame him. He rightly deserves a weekend off every once in a while, but the problem is this wasn't exactly a weekend off because it wasn't just Tiger Woods he was golfing with. His companions included Jim Crane and Milton Carroll of Western Gas, a natural gas company that does business in Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, and Wyoming. This is yet another strong reminder of just how much inside access this industry has for our policymakers. So when you look at this graph, it should come as no surprise that we seem to be stuck in the dark ages, while countries like Germany pull ahead with remarkable investments in clean, clean energy technology. This is where divestment comes in. We need to show the world that higher education no longer supports businesses who destroy the planet. We need to take away the fossil fuel industry's social license so that we can start making progress. So by now, I'm sure you're all wondering how much do universities have invested in fossil fuels? The American Petroleum Institute gives an estimate of around 2.9% of university endowments. So for a roughly $600 million endowment here at Northeastern, that comes out to $17.5 million. Northeastern is a leader in campus sustainability. We've made strides to improve our energy efficiency and reduce waste. As an institution of higher learning that prides itself on its commitment to sustainability and ethical behavior, 
We need to serve as a model for society. And it makes no sense to invest in greening the campus without greening the endowment. We cannot truly meet our ethical standards while we hold these financial positions. As renowned environmentalist Bill McKibben says, it makes no sense to pay for my education by investing in companies whose business plan guarantees that I will not pay planet to enact my education on. Therefore, you want our administration to immediately freeze new spending for new investment in fossil fuel companies and to gradually divest over five years. With divestment comes reinvestment. And that brings some exciting opportunities to advance our university's sustainability initiatives. A green revolving fund is one way of doing this, investing in energy efficiency upgrades and taking the monetary savings from those projects to replenish the fund. And in case we need a little extra motivation, BU has the most successful green revolving fund in the country, generating 57% returns. Now I'd like to share with you one final thought. In the API report I opened with, there was one sentence in particular that caught my eye. These industries claim that millions of Americans depend on them for retirement security. I challenge that. You see, I believe that a safe and stable planet is the key to retirement security for all Americans. Because the people that matter aren't just the shareholders in Exxon or PetroChina or BP. People that matter are the seven billion of us that are shareholders in this planet. We all have something at stake, and we all have a responsibility to preserve our future. So please, if you are an alumnus, or a student, or a professor, or a community member, reach out to your school or local institution. Join with me and the thousands of others who are working towards this goal. Nothing could be more important. And after the, this class's regular scheduled speakers, um, myself and a few other members of Pete will be having a table up in the main lobby where you can get more information, sign a petition, and look at our Facebook group if you're interested in that. Uh, thank, thank you very much again, and I look forward to hearing you.